Hi there, it's Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. If you uh, haven't seen any of this series before on the uh, tutorial for the XCI Adventure Game Engine, I'd recommend you go back to my channel, of course subscribe if you haven't already, and check out the uh, playlist right from the beginning. Uh, because I'm going through here step by step talking about each of the different aspects of uh, creating your own adventure game for the X16 Commander X16 retro computer using my engine, which I call XCI for Extremely Compact Interpreter. A uh, throwback to the adventure game engines of uh, sort of the late 80s, uh, early 90s, like uh, SCI and SCUM. So today, in this episode, I'm going to start getting into some of the, the basic concepts behind how you do animation within a game. Now, there are, are two different types of configurations where you are basically just doing animation. Uh, the first one, at least in terms of the sequence in which somebody experiences your game, is the title screen. And the title screen ex uh, just consists of just one big animation sequence. They're not interactive, there's no sort of uh, branching or uh, changing anything other than basically the look of what you're seeing. So the title screen is just one big animation sequence that you sit and watch and then you can just you know click out of at any time when you actually want to start playing the game. But then when you get to the levels that's where uh, a lot more facets come into play in terms of what the user interface and experience how they actually interact with the animation and, and how you end up really telling the story through a, a series of uh, visual cues and ultimately uh, puzzles or just some sort of sequence of events that your player has to go through in order to advance and eventually win the game. So what you have in the levels are a each level is just a set of sequences, and there are four main types of sequences. Uh, the first two are, are unique to each level. Uh, the first is the init sequence, which again is not necessarily uh, required, but you can have it. Uh, the init sequence is a sequence that is always going to execute whenever you load the level. So the very first thing that happens is the init sequence, if it exists. After that, if this is the first time the player has visited a level, then the first uh, sequence will execute. In subsequent visits, the first does not uh, get executed because it's not your first time there anymore. So that, that's a good place where if you want to have some sort of expository text come up or special graphics or just as a shortcut for a lot of states where you can have some basic assumptions about what the state is upon entering that level for the first time. And then after uh, init and first, it, we go through the entire uh, sort of introduction to the level when it first loads up. We go through those two sequences uh, if, if they exist and if it's appropriate to execute them in, the, in terms of the first, ex first sequence then it's just going to sit and wait for the trigger sequences. And there's two kinds of trigger sequences. You have the tool triggers, which is when you click on an area with a tool from the toolbar. And if you've seen some of the uh, previous games, uh, previous uh, videos of the example game or the, the game that we've been developing for this tutorial, uh, in that case we only have one tool to find in this tutorial so far, which is use. And we played around with creating some tool triggers that do a use with a, a particular area of the screen. And basically, whichever tool trigger is first defined for any particular tile space within a screen, that's going to be the default action. So when you just hover the mouse over it, it's that tool trigger's tool is going to change uh, what the uh, cursor is when you're over that area. And, and then if you go ahead and click, it will automatically use that tool, uh, which is, of course, prompted to the user in terms of which mouse cursor they see, if you set up uh, special mouse cursors for each tool, which you know, helps it along. Or if you just want to just make it transparent, you're, you have the same mouse cursor all the time. Anyway, that's how it works, is uh, 
if there's a tool trigger on that area and you click before selecting a tool, it will do that first one. And then you'll have subsequent tool triggers that would require the user to uh, go into the toolbar if, uh, you, if that tool trigger area overlaps uh, a, a previous one. And that's when uh, you can do alternate things like your default trigger can be look and then you could have a use trigger uh, or something to say that well the look would tell you that hey maybe this is something you want to use or this is something that perhaps requires the use of some sort of item and in that case we have the item trigger which in in the case of item triggers they those can't be default triggers because it requires you to actually go into your inventory to select a particular item and then use that item to click on that tile space on the screen. And that's what item triggers are for. And they, similar to the tool triggers, they uh, define a span of uh, tiles, basically a rectangle of tile spaces on the screen that if you click on that with a particular item, it'll execute that item trigger. And in all four of these cases within the levels, they end with an end anim uh, key. Now, in the case of the title screen, there is an end anim that is uh, implied because you only have that one sequence. You could end, add an end atom at the end. It won't affect anything, but uh, if you want to see a little bit under the hood of how XCI works, it just, the SDK automatically just adds an ed an, end anim at the end of the title screen sequence, which just lets the engine know that, all right, we're done executing and we're going to move on. And in the case of the title screen, that means we're just going to go to the, the menu and wait for further input for the user. In the other cases with init and first, we're doing... Uh, after the end end anim of init, if the if it's the first time you're there, it will check to see if you have a first sequence. It'll go ahead and then execute that first sequence in that case. Otherwise, uh, if there's no first sequence or it's not your first time, it will then just after executing the init sequence, it will sit and wait and for whatever the next tool trigger is. And as we'll see, the the effects of these uh, different sequences can overlap. Uh, depending on um, which sort of instructions you include in there. So let, let's now talk about what are these kinds of instructions and we'll go back to the example game to see some examples of uh, how these different instructions work. So first, uh, just to cover our bases, there are four basic kinds of effects that can take place from an animation instruction. The most obvious one being graphical effects. We're uh, placing tiles and sprites on the screen, changing their appearance, moving them around, and you know traditional uh, our traditional concept of what animation is. But of course, uh, when we're talking about designing a game, there's there's more to animation than just the visual. It's uh, it's all tied into the actual user experience. So in addition to just basically defining what graphics are going to happen, we have to have things that uh, exist over time. So there are temporal effects, including sort of delaying a, a part of the sequence. So a sequence just is in a holding pattern and then uh, wait. In fact, that's the command. Uh, the instruction is there's the wait instruction to wait a, a amount of time before continuing executing that particular sequence. And then there are certain effects that are periodic where we're saying that, all right, we're going to execute this uh, sprite movement and it's just going to cycle through the frames uh, and then each frame is going to be visible for a particular amount of time and then we just kick that sequence off and it has a particular end state but until we hit that end state it's just going to periodically go and do that execution and while that starts we are continuing the, the sequence that kicked it off and if it comes to an end then that's still going to go on and the same thing goes with things like sound effects. We're just going to say, all right, here's the sound effect. You're going to start playing it. And uh, the sequence may be over by the time that sound plays, but it's already been kicked off. And then we have uh, state effects, things that affect the state of the game. And the state of the game is basically what denotes where you are in the game, what's your progress, what's happened. And, and those are the basic things that when you actually uh, enable saving a game and then restoring it, what it's going to restore are these state variables. Now, there are uh, Boolean states. They're just you know true or false, set or cleared. 
and uh, you could have several thousand of those within your game. And then you have inventory, <clears throat> and that's quantitative. So you have a certain number of inventory items, and uh, you have for each item you have a, a specific quantity of that item. And then, of course, uh, the the big state is the level. What level are you on? And there are, of course, uh, instructions that will change what level you are at. Mainly the go level instruction. And then finally, we have text effects. Now, of course, these are similar to graphical effects. This is just changing what the user sees, but it's in a separate context, whereas graphical effects are uh, for the area over the uh, bit, the background of the of the level, and then there's the text area below that, and uh, so it's a separate area where text animation can occur, and so there's an entirely separate set of instructions for that. Of course, you can overlay text as uh, tiles uh, via graphical commands, but we when we've shown a bit of how that works already. But the actual text effects we're talking about are text that appears in the actual text field. So then when, when we talk about all those different types of effects, now we can talk about the different kinds of instructions that occur. And the first kind of instructions are immediate instructions. So when you're in the middle of executing a sequence, these are the things that are just going to happen right now. They're going to have an immediate effect on what the user sees, hears, and so forth. And uh, in terms of graphics, these are the sprite command, the, which shows a sprite on the screen, the sprite frames command, so that it will immediately change that sprite to use the first frame that is uh, specified by sprite frames. But of course, sprite frames also specify, can specify multiple frames. And in that case, then there, as we'll see later, a command that will go and uh, sort of rotate through those frames so that you can see uh, later what frames you'll see. But you do have the immediate effect of changing that frame. And then sprite hide, which is the opposite of sprite, which instead of showing a sprite at a particular location, it will just hide it wherever it is, and it just becomes I invisible. Uh, and then, of course, you have the basic tiles command, which displays a row of tiles. And we've, we've seen examples of some of these in previous videos. Uh, as we have also seen the idea of uh, text instructions. And, of course, the most basic text instruction being text. So the uh, a text command just displays line of text at the uh, current row at which uh, within the text field that we're actually displaying text. Then there's the uh, scroll instruction, which can scroll the text upward a, a given number of lines. Uh, a line uh, instruction, which will uh, sort of skip a line, just does a, a new line, if you will, without any text uh, in it. And then a clear, which will just clear the entire text screen. So a, a lot of uh, a lot of trigger instructions will start with a clear, so that whatever text comes out of that uh, trigger will will start right at the top of the text area, and you don't have you're not cluttered up with previous text output. And then you have finally the uh, state instructions, things that affect the state, and in this case also immediately. So there is a, a set and clear state which affects those Boolean states. Get item which adds uh, quantities of items to the inventory, and then go level which will, as you might suspect, has your player then go to the level specified. So let let's take a look at how some of these are, are used. Now, uh, if we backtrack a bit to that first, we sh uh, first slide, the title screen is one big sequence, and the levels have those four different kinds of sequence. Let's take a look at what that actually looks like in our example game. So I'm going to go over here to the code, and here is the uh, start screen on the left. And so start screens, like I said, are just one big uh, sequence, and there's only one unique instruction that can be in a uh, title screen configuration and that's the duration and here we say all right this is just going to last for 10 seconds and then we just do a bunch of uh, animation instructions uh, after defining of course what the bitmap and the background music are and then we uh, set some uh, sprite frames so you say sprite frame one is going to have this sequence 
of, uh, of frames, starting, f starting with frame 1. And then we go ahead immediately and say sprite 1 is going to be placed at this location, at, at x16, y200. And it's we know that at that point, sprite frames has been set. Uh, the sprite frame of sprite 1 has been set to sprite frame 1. And we'll see what that looks like. And th this is actually the little avatar guy that we're going to see uh, running across the screen. And then we put some tiles down. And these tiles are the byline. It says by John Doe. That's what uh, all these decimal values are the uh, decimal ASCII codes for the, those uh, characters. And then we're going to, and then here we get into the actual uh, temporal part of it where we're waiting two jiffies and then we start. Uh, moving so pretty much right away we start cycling through this animation uh, and we're having this little guy run so every frame uh, or every frame of uh, animation is going to take uh, two jiffies uh, that's what we see here so that's uh, one thirtieth of a second and then there's going to we're going to do 68 frames and after each frame we are going to move to the right two pixels and that's how we make him run across the screen so that's pretty fast because every basically uh you're going 60 pixels per second and then we wait 136 jiffies which gives us just enough time uh, to execute this move so what we could be doing at the same time is while that's moving we could go ahead and uh, have some other sprites do some other movement or make other things appear or whatever but in this case we're just we just want to wait it out wait till the end and then we uh, here we place some tiles up and we're using tile 3 tile 3 is the uh, that rainbow butterfly x16 logo and we just we sprinkle a few around where that sprite's going to end up. And then we wait an interminably long time here. It's so long it requires two uh, wait instructions because uh, wait instructions can only go up to 255 jiffies. So we want to wait uh, 386 uh, jiffies until we then uh, sort of nags like, uh, hello, what are you doing? <laughs> Why haven't you clicked away? Nothing more to see here. And then, of course, once we get to the end of that 600 uh, jiffies, the 10 seconds, we uh, go ahead and exit. And so so let's take a, a look for a little refresher as uh, to what that looks like. And there it is. So we see the background bitmap. We saw the little uh, avatar run to the middle of the screen. And there are those little tiles that popped up. And we saw these tiles that were already... Up here it said by John Doe, and then of course that little naggy hello came up at the end. And, and that was it. That's how we define that whole animation sequence. So there's, uh, unlike what we'll see in other cases, there is no branching, there's, uh, there's no interaction, it just goes ahead and plays. So let, let's take a, a look back here at some of these other instructions. Uh, now, you'll notice we didn't see any text in there because when we're in the title screen, there is no text field. It's just the, the graphics field takes up the entire screen, so you can place sprites and tiles uh, anywhere that, that are visible, and they will uh, not be overlapping, say, the menu or the uh, text area, the toolbar, or any other stuff that you'd see within the context of the game. And, uh, and then... Of course, there were no states in there because uh, states don't really help you when you're just talking about a uh, title screen animation because there's no interaction. It's just we're just going to play a little movie to watch. So you didn't see any of that in there. So we're we're going to go to a level that will show how that works. But first, uh, let's talk a bit about the uh, temporal instructions, like we saw before. Uh, first we saw the wait, and that's pretty self-explanatory. We're waiting a number of jiffies before continuing in the sequence. And then there is the sprite move, and we saw that sprite move uh, right here. We kicked off this uh, sprite move, and that started happening, and so it was happening simultaneous to this wait command. So we were uh, we kicked it off here, and then as this wait was executing, it was scrolling through each of the frames of uh, that sprite move instruction. And then play is the, uh, a sound effect. And, uh, and similar to the sprite move, it gets kicked off basically when you uh, have that play instruction in the sequence. And then depending on the length of that sound effect, it will continue to play uh, 
perhaps well after that uh, sequence is finished executing. And the same thing goes to sprite move. It could go on for quite a while, and your trigger would just be, I'll well, just go ahead and do that sprite move, and then you can free up the user to do something else uh, while the, the, that sprite is moving. So let's go and see what the other main kind of instruction that we have. And that is, those are branching instructions. Now, as you'll notice up here, we didn't list that as an animation effect. Well, because it's, it's not really. It, it's something that we put within an animation sequence to provide structure to it. So it does not have a visual effect uh, on its own. But what it gives you is the ability to, uh, based on current game state, uh, def it defines what you're able to do. And in this case, uh, the only kind of state it really looks at is the uh, those uh, boolean states that if we went back up here to the state the set state and clear state set those boolean states uh, the get item state those get used in uh, that sort of state affects item triggers where certain item triggers will have a particular requirement and cost so you have to have a particular quantity of that item for that trigger to be executed and that's w w the way that state gets used it doesn't get used in any sort of if statement so like an if can't say oh if my I have more than such and such item do this it doesn't work that way so you're gonna have to use boolean states to uh, deal with that and then go level just has an immediate effect on the state because then you're just you're just immediately loading that next level and you're you're there basically so there's uh, nothing to check for there because you're just you are where you are so going back here to branching instructions so the way branching instructions work is that there are they're just basic uh, a branch will either start with an if or an if not and then after that if or if not there is a subsequence so uh, there is a, a single value after if or if not and that would be a state identifier so we'd say if this state that means if that state has been set then we'll execute the subsequence after it and then we get to an end if uh, instruction and that's how we know that that particular if sequence is done now you can have within one of these subsequences uh, more if or if not statements in there and of course if not will an if not sequence or subsequence will execute if a state is clear and we can see here what the basic structure is is here where we've got a sequence where it does some activity and then we had we had a branch point an if or an if not and if uh, if that state is uh, what you've specified it will go ahead and execute this uh, subsequence if it's not it will just short circuit to the end if so this is the end if for this uh, state the, the, this beginning of the subsequence so there's no concept uh, uh, like most high-level languages have an else uh, there is no else in XCI there is just an if or if not and so you could have back-to-back uh, -back if and if not sequences and then you know that one only one of them is going to get executed but what you have is the additional flexibility of having a sequence where you go into uh, say an if sequence and then you clear the state that uh, you that was set for you to get into that if se if sequence and then uh, and then that if not sequence for that same state is right below it you're gonna go ahead and execute that too because now by the time you've gotten to that if not the state's been cleared so th those are that's another consideration for when you're uh, creating the game is that you're not going to sort of uh, uh, short circuit things and or uh, do certain things uh, more times than you intended but so here you can see uh, again here within the subsequence of uh, if that if or if not was uh, true then we execute some activity and then we hit another if or if not point and then if that's true here we've got uh, some more activity and then we get back to the end if finish this subsequence and then go that to that end if so we can see here uh, basically uh, there are 
um, three paths basically that this sequence would go through. It could just uh, uh, fail this if and just short circuit right there to the end. This if could pass and then it goes through and uh, and short circuits this one and then continues on or it could end up taking e uh, each if and say yep we're going up here and we're going up here and then we're just flowing through and that's pretty much how branching works it's it's very basic um, and you can't get real fancy with it again they're just boolean states there's no uh, comparison operations or or things like that that you would see in other high level languages so you, you just uh, can just use a whole lot of uh, of these uh, boolean variables uh, that you want and, and they can just sort of stack up or they can be reused uh, however you want to use them you, you got a lot to play with within the engine so let's take a look at zone zero level one which if we uh, start playing the game oh and we <laughs> that's right we are still playing so let's go ahead and start so we do a new game and what we'll see here, this is Zone Zero Level Zero, which, uh, like the title screen, is uh, non-interactive. There's no triggers in it. There's just an init sequence. But you saw it did include some text. And we, we, have, it, we have some text uh, also here. Now we're in Zone Zero Level 1. And we saw, yep, we uh, have a bitmap of the kitchen. And we have the music with Zone Zero. We're going to go ahead and kill that music. Hey, that's a lot nicer. But we also define a, a sound effect. So it's going to load up this coffee.raw uh, sound effect and use that for, uh, for a sound effect at some point in the game. And we're calling that sound effect coffee. So the init sequence is what gets executed first and always gets executed. And this is where we sort of lay out some things like the coffee maker. The coffee maker is made of these uh, six tiles right here. And so the coffee maker is always going to be there and then uh, we set up the sprite frames for the steam which we're, we're going to see here in a little bit uh, but we're just setting up the frames ahead of time so we don't have to do it later and then we have uh, some stateful stuff here first we check to see if the bananas have been taken so if they've not been taken we go ahead and put the bananas there and uh, and those bananas again that's like four different tiles to uh, place the bananas there and then if the cup hasn't been taken we go ahead and put the cup there so we have uh, two tiles for the cup and then we also set up a bunch of states so we say if the cup has been taken then we know that the coffee has not been made we're not holding the carafe and the coffee's not been poured so we, we set up all these different states to say all right here's where we're at uh, we're making sure that we have uh, reset to this uh, basic condition of being able to make some coffee and then pour it into the cup and then after knit we can see here the first uh, sequence so this is the first time right now that we're playing that we've uh, been to this uh, uh, level and so here it goes ahead and prints out this text as we saw here it, it it does like one line at a time and has little weights in between showing that and we can see these this very text show up in there and so say if we walk out of the kitchen <laughs> we got to wait for this text oh let me get the mouse cursor back to where it needs to be and we walk back to the kitchen and now you'll notice this first sequence didn't execute anymore. It executed and it put these uh, tiles back up there, but it didn't execute first because this isn't our first time here. So we don't do that. And now we're just waiting for these tool triggers. So let's take a look here at this first tool trigger. It's for the coffee maker. And we say we're, our tool trigger is going to use, it's going to be the use, which uh, if we look down here, our use is uh, this guy right here, the hand. Or if we uh, show our help with control, oh yeah, use or take, that's the hand. <laughs> okay, so here, oh, now we can see the cursor changes to the use cursor because I'm over that coffee maker, which are uh, these, uh, these tile coordinates. And, and then it goes through and starts checking for some states. We haven't made the coffee yet, so it's not going to execute 
this subsequence. Uh, it's going to say if copy made, nope. So let's short circuit to the end if that corresponds to it. And it says if not copy made, nope, copy is not made. So then it's going to clear the text and say, okay, I'll make some coffee. Wait uh, a second. That's 60 jiffies is a second. And then it's going to start showing the steam. And that is that Sprite 2, which, as we saw up here, for Sprite 2, we've defined this uh, four-frame sequence. And it's going to go ahead and uh, immediately on Sprite show that first frame and then execute a Sprite move uh, instruction. We're saying, okay, for Sprite 2, we are going to do uh, every 12 jiffies, uh, we're going to do 150 frames. Uh, which will, so 12 jiffies times 150, that's uh, uh, 30 seconds of animation at 5 frames a second. And and you'll notice here the sprite move is 0, 0. We're not moving. We want that, that sprite to stay in the, that fixed position and then just cycle through those four. So let's go ahead and execute this. As you'll notice here, what we're going to expect to see after we uh, start that steam, the two seconds will go by, and then we're going to fill the carafe. And then here we're replacing some tiles. They're the tiles of this carafe right here. And they're going to be replaced with versions of those tiles that have uh, appear to have coffee in the carafe. And then it's going to put up the text to say, done, smells good, and then set that state for coffee made so that when we click on it again, it'll go back to that first sequence we saw before saying that coffee was made. And this is why we have the if not coffee made after, because uh, unconditionally after executing coffee made, the coffee made is uh, going to be set. So we don't want to execute the other, the other one right after. We want to just get that out of the way first so that we don't do it again. All right, and there it goes. And there's our our little sprite animation is happening. It says done, smells good. Now we'll go back here and now we're going to click on the coffee maker again to pick up the carafe. And so we're going to say here, if the coffee is made, uh, the coffee is made. Are we holding the graph? We're not holding it yet. So we're going to go down here to the if not holding carafe. And it's going to clear the text and say yes, nice fresh coffee. Wait a second. And then say let's find a good cup to pour it into. And then it's going to set that state for holding carafe. So I click it, and you notice there's nothing changed, just the text. And uh, we've <laughs> run out of time. We've spent so long that that uh, original sprite move for the uh, Steam is no longer executing. And then what we want to be able to do is uh, put it in the cough, uh, pour it down into the cup. But if we go back here and look at this trigger, it's like if the coffee's made, and if you're a whole, already holding craft, which we are, it's going to say, well, let's not make more coffee with this fresh coffee. Perk sucks. Yeah, we're not going to just pour the coffee back into the coffee machine. And that's how we get that. Here you can see there. And then finally, a hey, dummy, find a cup. All right, so we're going to click on that cup. And if we go down a bit and we see uh, clicking on the coffee cup with the use tool, the cup is not taken, but we are holding the carafe. And then it's going to say, sure, pour the whole pot, blah de blah de blah And we'll do that. And there we go. And we can see it did that. And, yeah, it sure pulled the whole, whole pot. It played that coffee sound effect. And and then it uh, replayed the that sprite sequence after moving the, the sprite for the steam down to here over the cup. And that's it. That's how we've uh, used this over and over again. And now uh, the second one, if we click on that coffee cup again, if the cup's not taken and we're not holding the craft, we're not holding it anymore because we've poured it. And if the coffee's been poured, it will say, go ahead, take it with you, remove the cup, and then add coffee to your inventory. Because if we look right now at our inventory, we just have still that initial inventory. Nothing's in there other than the start stuff we started with. And we go ahead and we take the coffee, and there it is. It's removed the tiles. And now we look in the inventory. Hey, there's we got one coffee, and uh, that's how we've uh, we've contributed to the state of the inventory. We've got all these different booleans set, and uh, we're ready to sort of continue in our adventure. And 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 that's 
that's some very you know high level basics of uh, of what we're able to do. So we saw here a d bunch of different ways of going through those uh, uh, animations, and we saw uh, again going back uh, all the different ways that we uh, dealt with time and how we made immediate changes. And we even saw a go level where I, I clicked on that doorway and that triggered a go level. We're, we're not going to look into that. We're going to, in a later video, we're going to go into some of these different instructions in, in more depth. But this uh, video was just to give you a basic overview of, uh, of what we were trying to do so that you can provide a little context of what we're trying to do in the game. Um, as I've uh, mentioned in previous videos, I've got a lot of documentation right here on GitHub. I'm going to have the links uh, down in the description. We can see here in the uh, level files uh, part of the documentation, I get into detail for these first two levels, that uh, uh, both levels of Zone Zero that we've just uh, seen in this video. I get into all the details of how I uh, uh, created those, and then uh, some details about each of these different instructions, how they're all built, and then if you want to find out more about those instructions, you can go over here to the XCI syntax file, uh, the markdown file, and we, here we can see there are the different keys that are used for the title screen file and the different keys are used for the level file. And we'll notice there's a great overlap. As I said before, duration is only one that's unique. And then if we look at things like uh, bitmap, we can see that that's applicable to both the title screen file and level file. So all most of the uh, sort of graphical animation stuff uh, is also uh, you'll see in each of those cases like sprite and tiles they're applicable to uh, both kinds of uh, animations and that's it that's all i got for you today so i, ho I hope you found this interesting uh, or inspiring and that uh, you're going to be interested in uh, checking out uh, xci like i said the link will be down in the description you can get there uh clone it on github uh, fork it and then maybe build on it yourself or just uh, start playing around with one of the releases and try uh, creating your own game, messing around with the example games that I have out there. And uh, I hope you have a good time with it. And uh, especially right now, we're still in the middle of this quarantine, and I, I hope you're using this time productively and uh, coming up with something that is not going to be just oh I, I just sat around and watched tv all day that you, you went out and you did something you created something that you can go back and look on and say hey i spent this time really well i learned something new i created something and i'm going to go back and enjoy that for years to come so uh thanks again i, I hope you like this video i hope you go back and watch uh, all of these episodes if you haven't already i hope you go again <laughs> go to that github uh, link in the description and uh really importantly here on youtube that you uh, like uh, this video uh please place some comments in there and uh and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Do the whole deal. Uh, we'd love to have some more subscribers here and uh, talk some more about these uh, old games being brought new again here for uh, platforms like the Commander X16. I'll uh, see you again soon with the next episode of this show. And uh, take care. Bye-bye.